Great, thank you. It's uh, wonderful to be here and um, uh, happy to be speaking to the Data Science Institute here. Um, you know, my background is, my academic background is in experimental physics. And what I found is that the data analysis techniques I learned in physics um, are really highly applicable to so many of the situations uh, that uh, we face in the real world. Data science wasn't really a field when I went to school, um, but um, it, it, it's emerged as that as a key uh, driver of so much of our technology industries. And uh, within my company, we have a data science department now. And um, you know, it's about nine people uh, that covers, um, we do computer vision within that group. Uh, we do management of large-scale data structures, uh, and we do a lot of uh, uh, data analysis on specific experiments. And so I'll show you a little bit about that today. Um, uh, so this talk, I'm going to give you a uh, kind of broad overview of uh, Viam, uh, the company, uh, and uh, I'll try and weave the, uh, the, the data science pieces through it, um, and happy to talk about it and take this wherever. Uh, you as a group think, think we should go with it. Um, I wasn't quite sure how to target this, so there n are no equations in this, in this, in this lecture. <laughs> but there are a, a lot of charts um, and some data, so um, let's get into it. First, um, a little bit of background on the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, this is where um, I decided that I wanted to start my next company. And um, on the left here, uh, most of you are probably familiar with this chart. This is a, uh, a illustration of Moore's law. You can see on this beautiful log scale, uh, the computing power, what are we actually pl plotting here? MIPS per $1,000 uh, going up and to the right. And um, uh, this is you know, one of the most remarkable technological phenomena, um, even one of the most re remarkable natural phenomena that we know of for things to grow in this way. Uh, at this rate, this scale over this many orders of magnitude. And um, we just look around, we can see how it's transformed our society and the things it's enabled. Well, um, on the right, uh, this is the sort of corresponding chart for the pharmaceutical industry. And what we're looking at here, it's again a log scale, and we're looking at how many drugs get produced per a billion dollars. So. Um, you can see that uh, going back to 1950, it's down and to the right. Uh, that every year, it gets more and more expensive to develop new drugs. Um, and there are various reasons that are hypothesized for this. Um, uh, you know, perhaps it's that regulation's getting stronger. Um, one of the most compelling ones is just that we've got a lot of good drugs. It gets increasingly harder to get the next good drug uh, because you're, they call it the better than the Beatles problem. Uh, how do you make something that's better than the Beatles? Well, um, it takes more and more money. Uh, there's actually kind of interesting structure here. If you look at that uh, little uprise around 2000, um, where the slope goes up, that's the biotechnology revolution, uh, where companies like Genentech and Amgen actually gave us a new way to find drugs instead of just using small molecules, um, you know, uh, molecules that might have 100 atoms or less in them. Uh, we're now using proteins and antibodies and all those great things. But uh, this is a terrible story from a, a, a sort of sustainability standpoint. Uh, in fact, it's been called Eram's Law, which is um, more backwards uh, because it's going exactly the wrong way. Uh, and one of the ideas behind founding the company was how can we use all the great advances that have come out of Moore's Law on the left to bend the curve on Eram's Law? And so when uh, we were looking to start a new company, that was kind of the big space we, we, we stepped into. So uh, a little bit more about uh, the drug discovery process. <clears throat> this is um, one way of thinking about it, uh, sort of this funnel view, where you start out on the left with, say, uh, 10,000 compounds. And uh, you do some molecular tests on them. You've got a hypothesis that uh, this compound uh, will <coughs> bind with this target, and that'll modulate this pathway. Uh, you test that uh, in a test tube. Then you move on to cells, uh, and you um, uh, do what's called high-throughput screening, where you have these big robots uh, that will take a single cell, and they'll put a drop of the drug on it, and you'll sort of look at what happens to the cell. 
um, give you some in indication, like is it getting through the cell wall? Is it changing something in the cell? Is it killing the cell? Um, that all feeds into the information. So uh, in that way, you're screening out things that are just not interesting um, for various reasons. Um, then out of that, you come with a set of compounds, then you go into animal studies. And uh, here, uh, you've got a hypothesis that it's going to affect some disease. You want to test and see if it's safe and effective uh, in, in various organisms because you're, you're sort of walking up uh, the phylogenetic chain closer and closer to humans. And then there's a big, uh, a big step here where you go do your first in man studies. Um, and that's when you've got an, enough belief that these compounds, um, they uh, are promising, uh, that you know they're safe enough, that um, you can put them into people at a low dose. And then you advance through various phases of, of human clinical trials. Uh, testing progressively on larger populations, uh, being more rigorous about um, is this drug not just safe, does it actually do something, does it do something better than the drugs that are already on the market. And if you get through all that, well, then you submit that big data package to the FDA, uh, they review it, and they say, go, go sell it. Um, and that's a huge success. And um, this whole, whole uh, funnel um, takes about 15 years to run and two and a half billion dollars per drug. So it's a tremendously enormous endeavor. Uh, and to give you an indication, like last year, I think there were 19 new drugs approved. So each one of these that makes it through there is really a gem. And uh, there's this enormous R&D apparatus that is built up around doing this. Um, about 200 billion dollars are spent every year uh, running running this, this pipeline, basically, because the payoffs are so big. Pharmaceuticals are a trillion dollar industry. So we looked at this, and our analysis was that there was a real opportunity in animal studies. And I'll, I'll give you a few pieces of that. Um, but on this level, it's a really high leverage point because the really expensive stuff is in human clinical trials. That's where, uh, because you're dealing with people and safety and everything, privacy, everything associated with that, the costs just go through the roof. Um, you know, it can cost just that part of it um, more than a billion dollars. Uh, and so we looked at it and we said, well, if we could make better decisions at the animal stage, oh, and one other thing I should add, um, compounds are fa failing all the way through here. Only about 10% of the compounds that go into human clinical trials end up getting approved. So it's mostly a story of failures. Uh, and you can benefit if you can fail earlier, because then you aren't investing all that subsequent money in it. So um, we said, if we can make better decisions at the animal level, well, uh, in that way, uh, we, if we can move that from 10% to 11% or 12%, that would be pretty incredible uh, from a financial standpoint, not to mention the human benefit of this. I mean, uh, you know, many people who participate in clinical trials, the drugs are they're really in pretty desperate circumstances, and they're, they're pinning a lot of hope on the drugs. And unfortunately, most of the time, they don't work. So if we can get better drugs into human clinical trials, societal benefit, and there's a good business there. So we started digging into how animal studies work. And um, people don't like animal studies very much um, because they're hard to do. Uh, the results aren't reproducible. Um, they're uh, often. Um, corrupted by various things. Um, on the right here, so Nature's kind of been a, on a tear on this. These are our three headlines from Nature magazine. And um, uh, it's just sort of acknowledged that um, uh, if you do a mouse study in a lab uh, and someone else runs that, it's pretty unlikely you're going to get the same results. Really hard to do. And so we said, why is that? And what can we do to make it better? And how can, how can we bring technology into it? And so what we did is uh, we started uh, touring these facilities and seeing how they run. And um, we actually teamed up with uh, Cliff Roberts, who is the, the vet here at Berkeley. Uh, he was over at UCSF at the time, took us through. And um, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been in a, a mouse lab. Um, you've got just racks and racks of basically stainless steel racks with plastic cages. Um, I'll show you a picture in a little bit. and. Um, Oftentimes, the data collection is really, really manual. I mean, it can be at the level of someone walking up to the cage, looking in it, and saying, OK, uh, that animal looks a little bit lethargic. And they note that down on a notebook. 
or um, on a five point scale, this animal is a two and a half. Um, you know, sort of, and maybe there's some rules that go with that, but they're, uh, they're, they're pretty flexible. And um, we've actually seen that if you ask like three people to grade the same animal, they'll all get different an answers. Uh, and so we thought that this was a big opportunity for technology. And to put it in context a little bit more, if you look across the uh, drug development process, beginning on the left at the molecular and cellular, there have been huge uh, technology investments and data activities that have come out of that. Uh, you know, you're all familiar with the genome and the omics revolution. And um, out of that, there have been whole industries that have built up. So if you think about uh, a company like Illumina, which has made better gene se sequencing technology, uh, next generation sequencing, they call it, that's allowed scientists to understand the effects of, of genes on biological processes more. And then that's fed back to Illumina, who then is challenged by that to make better instruments. And so you get this kind of virtuous cycle where the technology pushes the biology, which then pushes the technology back, and it just gets better and better and better. Uh, and because there's so much money involved in this, a lot gets invested into it, and you get these incredible tools where uh, I think one of the few things that's exceeded Moore's law is the gene sequencing, uh, the, the law governing gene sequencing, where the cost is plummeting even faster than, than Moore's law. If we look on the right side here, there has also been a tremendous amount of data that's collected. So now human clinical trials, uh, because they're so expensive uh, and because you're putting uh, uh, people into these situations where their safety has to be considered, um, you collect all the data you can. Uh, increasingly, uh, well, there, there's all kinds of blood work that comes out of that, uh, biomarkers, imaging. Increasingly, uh, people are using digital health tools, activity monitors, things like that. Um, and that's led to uh, a better understanding of patient segmentation. So uh, maybe my drug doesn't work in the whole population, but in this group, it works really well. And if you can find that group, then uh, you've got something that helps people a lot. So finding uh, the right drug for the patient, that's what's called sometimes precision medicine. Um, and there's been a tremendous uh, amount of advancement around that. But if you look in the middle here, this, this animal stage, it just hasn't gotten any love from anyone. Um, there's been no technology investment into it. It's this field that um, most people don't know about. They don't realize how important it is, uh, how much money is spent in it, and that it's still really pretty archaic in terms of the way things are run. Uh, and so this is where we focused our efforts. And that was sort of the founding idea behind Viam. So uh, we founded the company back in 2013. We had this kind of cute name, Mousera, when we started it. Uh, and we spent about three years in stealth. I guess I need to update this because we're in 2017 now. Um, we launched publicly last year. And um, uh, I'll sh show you a lot from that in just a little bit. Uh, one thing, you know, at, over lunch we were talking about the interdisciplinary work, nature of a lot of the work that happens here. Well, one of the amazing things that happens when you come into an adjacent field is that um, you often see things you can transfer, translate. Um, new ways of doing things. So uh, when Joe betz lacroix and I founded the company, uh, the first summer, we just spent writing IP, writing patents, because we look at it and we say, well, why don't they do it like they do it over in the semiconductor industry? Or, um, geez, we can do that better. And a lot of the time, I can't actually believe they still do it like that. And so with this, we, we built up a big invention uh, portfolio. And what I'm going to show you today is really sort of the leading edge of that. Um, these are the things that we've spent the past three years developing. They're like ready uh, at a scientific quality that they're actually delivering value to scientists. But um, uh, this is uh, part of my pitch for if any of you are interested in coming to Viam, come talk to me. Um, there's a lot more behind this. Uh, and uh, you know we've got probably a decade of work to fill out this whole thing. So what is it we've done? Well, we looked at it. Um, that, that the first area that really needed transformation was around data collection uh, to do away with uh, these subjective manual measurements uh, to get people out of the loop because, well, people stress out animals, they interfere with the experiment, uh, and you'll get a different answer depending on which person is doing the measurement. So uh, our approach was to take every low-cost sensor we could get our hands on, sensors that are low-cost because they're in your phone or your computer or your car or consumer electronics. I mean, we really just went through the DigiKey catalog and ordered everything we could. 
And um, we, we pointed it at, the, at a mouse cage and started collecting data and just started looking for interesting things. And I'll show you some of that. But uh, what we learned really quickly is the most powerful low-cost sensor today is the HD video camera, which is you know $10 because it's in your cell phone. Uh, there's all kinds of capabilities around it. Um, it's really a remarkable device. And so uh, we have a number of other sensors, like air sensors to measure temperature, and uh, water vapor sensors, various gas sensors. Um, we've just developed an in-cage scale. But uh, far and away, our most powerful data stream is that HD video data. And so um, one of the principles here was we wanted to design this for scale. We didn't want this to be a specialized sort of piece of equipment that you put on your bench and you have one or two of them. There's 8 million mouse cages in the, in the world. And we wanted to do something that could actually take over that entire space to make this the new standard for data collection. So uh, we've got all this data from these video cameras and other sensors going up into the cloud. And um, we run all this in Amazon Web Services, which uh, again is one of these technologies that just makes it possible to do things you couldn't do five years ago. Um, we've at any given time got uh, five to 10,000 CPUs running. Um, our corpus is uh, about four petabytes right now. And um, if we were to start this company earlier, we'd essentially be in the data center business. Um, and with the great APIs and everything like that, we just abstract that away and uh, focus on our work. So we've got the data going up into the cloud. There, um, we've got an image processing pipeline that uh, I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, pulling features out of the video. Um, we run various algorithms looking for patterns in the data, uh, collecting, uh, cleaning the data. And then uh, we present it back to the scientists through uh, what we call our research suite. And uh, this is an online application um, where you can, uh, through your laptop, design a study, run it, and analyze it, uh, all, from, all from a web-based app. And um, I'll take a minute to show you how that works now. So this is our uh, research suite, um, uh, all uh, browser-based over uh, HTTPS. Uh, there's, th uh, I'll s there's a study designer in here, which I won't spend a lot of time on. This is just, um, you can select your study type, uh, say I want to run a lupus study, I can go in here, I can give it a name, uh, and um, I've got the protocol, I can select the model, and there's like a little wizard here where I can design the experiment and put it all together. And when I get it right, well, we're in business, so we quote you the price. Um, uh, I just uh, submit it, and then it goes off and it starts the study right away. Um, once the study's underway, it shows up on your dashboard. And so here are a few different studies we have. Uh, so this is a, uh, an arthritis model. Uh, this is a lupus model. This is multiple sclerosis. Uh, this is a lung injury model. Um, and I can go into any one of these. Let's look at this uh, lung injury model. Um, and I've got a nice kind of overview here of how the study is running. So uh, I can see exactly where my animals are. Uh, they're all through the acclimation phase, um, and they're in the induction phase right now. And what we're bringing here is transparency to researchers. So normally, if you want to know what was going on with a study, you'd have to call someone up or go down into the lab or look at it. Here we're putting that, that information right up for you. Here below this, we have these two charts. These are what we call our hero charts. And um, we customize them for every study type. But they're the two, two charts that sort of show you most concisely what's going on with the study. And um, what we're doing here is we've got a control group in black. Um, this blue group uh, is giving, being given a chemical called Paraquat, uh, which um, causes an injury to the lung that uh, simulates many of the conditions you'd get in, say, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, uh, also industrial accident type situations. And um, what you can see here is we're looking at the breathing rate and after we give them the paraquat, which is what happens right here on the dotted line, uh, the breathing rate goes up, and it's high. And you can see these nice tight error bars, beautiful separation between them. Uh, this is all collected automatically in real time. So as the study's going on, you see the new data points coming here along the way. And that's something that we found is really important here. It's immediacy. If you go back to thinking about that 15-year timeline, 
where uh, we as an industry are spending $200 billion a year. Well, if you can make decisions faster, uh, if you can get the data faster and make your, your next choice, do I continue working on this drug or do I switch to another one, uh, that has tremendous value to it. Uh, it shortens up that whole timeline. Um, here on the right, you can see uh, motion. Uh, this is collected uh, also from computer vision. You can see the, the nighttime when they're active in these dark bands. Uh, they're active and inactive, active and inactive. Then we give them the paraquat, and the blue group is inactive for about three days, and then starts to recover. Uh, and then the black group uh, uh, has the same sort of control pattern all the way through. So uh, I won't spend a lot of time on the biology with this group, but uh, this is a, uh, you know, from a, a physiology standpoint, this gives you really important insights. And then you give drugs and you say, can I change those effects in one way or another? So that's kind of the overview. Now I can dive down, and these are the individual uh, uh, cages. Uh, so let's go into this group here. And um, I can click on this. And this is kind of the in-depth view. So across the top here, I've got a, a timeline. And I can pull out my selector here. Uh, let's look at a little bit more of the data. Uh, and then below this, I'm looking at kind of a zoom in of that. So here is motion, which we're extracting from uh, the video. And you can see the video over here on the left. Uh, and I can click on this at any time. So I might say, what's that little blip right there? Let's see if I can get on top of it there. Uh, uh, and this is actually a rat. Let's see. Oh, there we can see the rat coming out of its little house and sort of playing around. Uh, and uh, you can blow that up if you want to get a good look. Uh, and this allows uh, a researcher to go actually go back in time and say, hey, uh, I noticed this thing. Where did that come from? What was the course of events leading up to that? Because oftentimes in these experiments, uh, something unexpected will happen. And if you don't have this kind of record of it, you think you, you have no idea what it is. You speculate. Um, and then you have to run another experiment to isolate that. Here, because we're able to get it all at the same time, you can go back and learn that. Uh, and then you don't have to run another experiment. That means you go faster. It means you use fewer animals. It's great for everyone. Um, so here we're seeing the motion. And you can see these nice regular circadian patterns active, less active, active, less active. Uh, and then the period of inactivity here in recovery. Uh, here we're looking at breathing rate. Um, so this is also extracted from computer vision. And I'll, I'll show you just a little bit about how we do this. Uh, we essentially see the heaving of the chest walls. And we have ways of detecting that. And here you can see here's the baseline with occasional an outlier, like when the, the rat is really active, its breathing rate goes up. And then uh, this change to a new state here. Uh, after it's given the, the, the paraquat. Um, this observations panel is where we pull together all the other data around the experiment. So every one of these dots, if I hover over one, so here, this is the, it's hard to read, that's an intratracheal dose administration, 0.3 milliliters, and the rat was put under anesthesia. So it re represents either something that was done in the lab or um, something that was done, uh, like someone went on this interface and looked. So here, uh, you can see that uh, someone went online and they checked that there was enough water and enough food and that the animal looked all right. That's what all these dots are. Or increasingly, uh, these are outputs from algorithms. So our general strategy here is that first uh, we use people, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence, so to speak, uh, to go and watch the animals, label things, and then that serves as a training set uh, to go back and eventually develop the computer vision. Um, and uh, so we've got a ton of labeled data here. Uh, and really, one of our bottlenecks is making sense out of that. And we, we bring together all sorts of different data sources here. So like here, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, like here, these are, uh, this is from the uh, necropsy after the study was done. You can see the liver and the lung. Uh, and the heart. And uh, so we've got a complete record here of like everything that happened around the study all in one place. Uh, whereas previously, it was like in a notebook here and maybe in a spreadsheet there. And uh, this probably didn't even get recorded at all. What we've done effectively is that um, if you look at the, the data volume created in a typical experiment, it's on the order of kilobytes. And we're collecting terabytes per study here. 
So just a, a, a huge uh, increase in the amount of data, which corresponds to a lot of different tools you can, you can put to work on it. Um, I'll show you a few other interesting things. Um, this is one that's a really interesting observation that we haven't had any time to work on. So here we're looking at the temperature at the input of the cage and the output of the cage. And you can see that um, the black line, the output, is higher. The, the output air is warmer. And this is what you'd expect. These are little thermal generators. They're heating up the air. And in fact, you can see there's a lot of structure here. Uh, and if you go into it and you look at like these little bumps, you'll find that they correspond to periods of activity of the animal. So there, yeah, you can see the animal's active and it made that little bump there. Uh, so we're fairly sure that this is a metabolic readout of some sort, uh, that by looking at this difference, um, uh, we can actually get an indication of the energy expenditure of the animal. Uh, but I don't have anyone to do that project right now. So if any of you are looking for a project, this is a good one here. Um, one other thing we brought into this whole thing is quality control. Uh, so looking at, say, the illumination. And this was really drawn from techniques in the semiconductor industry, where you measure everything, and you control chart, and you make sure it's right on. Well, we're doing that with these kind of studies and bringing that kind of rigor to them so that um, you eliminate sources of variability. So one of the biggest sources of variability is you're running your study, someone comes in, in the, during the night, turns on the lights, and that can completely wreck a study. So we're measuring that, and we make sure that never happens, or if it does, we can detect it. So in this way, uh, we can dive down deep into what's happening on uh, a very particular uh, animal in a particular cage like this. Um, what you often want to do in a, uh, a research situation is you want to compare. You want to understand, like, is my drug working better than my control group? And that's where our analytics studio comes in. And so uh, what we've done here is um, we've got a, a kind of um, a way to configure uh, chart types really rapidly. Uh, this is done on kind of a per-study basis. Um, uh, this is done behind the scenes. Um, this is just writing Python code. Uh, I wish I knew exactly which library we were using, given the people here. Um, uh, but uh, we set this up, and then a researcher can come in and say, I want to look at the average daily breathing rate, and uh, I want to look at the average nighttime motion, and I want to track the brain weight, and I'm going to add those onto my dashboard here. And then every day come in and see how the study's going, and learn from that, and maybe in the course of the study learn uh, the study is going well, and I want to extend it in one way, or change it in one way, or um, I've learned all I'm going to do, um, time to work on something else. It allows that really rapid feedback, because this is all updating as the data is coming in. So that uh, is our app in a nutshell. Um, and what we've done here is taken a process which has really traditionally been very hands-on, low data, um, not very good tools around it. And we've put it on the web. We've collected a lot more data. And we've given the end user tools so that they can make sense out of that. And this is what it actually looks like. Uh, so uh, you can see this is our, our lab here. We're, um, we're under red light because uh, rodents can't see red light. It looks dark to them. Uh, and then we've got these white LEDs at every cage position, which illuminates each cage, which helps both the computer vision, because we've got uniform illumination. It's also much better for the animals. Traditionally, you'd just illuminate with the room light. So the animals at the top are getting 10x more light than the animals at the bottom. And people have convinced themselves that doesn't matter. We say, let's just try and control it. Let's try and do it a little bit better. Um, all the electronics are in this little slab here, uh, with cameras looking down. Uh, gas sensors going in and out. Uh, there's a little scale that sits inside the cage here and communicates wirelessly up to this whole thing. Uh, and then all these get networked together to a little box, which you can kind of see in the back here. Uh, uh, e each of these little boxes has uh, a Raspberry Pi or two in it that's actually attached to the cameras. Uh, they're networked. There's a switch box here. They all go into that switch. Uh, and then they're consolidated up uh, into uh, the roof. And um, uh, they go up to the cloud. And I'll show you a little bit more about how that works in a moment. So we are what you call a full stack startup in that um, we're not just doing hardware or just doing algorithms or just doing services. We're doing the whole thing. And that makes for a really interesting company and a really interesting experience. Because if you look at the, the type of people involved, we've got um, 
our data science group, our hardware group, our software development group. We've got scientists with backgrounds in all kinds of different fields of biology. We've got people who are expert in animal handling, veterinarians. Uh, we, we've got, um, of course, you need you know, business people and salespeople and stuff like that. And it's really through the intersection and the interactions between all these people that all this great stuff happens. So not very many times you get you know, someone who's expert in TensorFlow uh, talking to someone who's uh, expert in multiple sclerosis and discussing, hey, how can we work together and do something neat? And that's, that's a big part of what's behind what we do. So um, I, because uh, I unfortunately don't get to do much technical work anymore, I'm going to just give you a little gloss over how some of this works. Um, here's our basic system architecture. So on the left, those are all those cages and racks that, that I showed you. And uh, they all come together to what we call a base station. And this base station collects all the data and it serves as a buffer. Uh, so um, we're, we're streaming about 15 gigabytes per cage per day. Uh, and we've got thousands of these things, so you can do the math. On this base station, um, we have a big storage device, a big super redundant storage device. All the data gets written to that storage device. It's an NFS mount, basically. And then there are a set of processes on that storage device that copy it up to AWS. And the reason we did it that way is uh, this is important data. If the fiber gets cut, if the network goes down, we don't want to lose data. So that storage device is, is sized to hold about a, a week's worth of data. And we can buffer it up and then spool it out uh, if, if there's a loss of network connectivity once we restore things. Uh, we go into AWS. And uh, there we have an architecture with a series of workers uh, that process that data. So uh, the biggest data set we have is video. And um, we run a set of algorithms around that. We use heavily the spot instances on AWS. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, you, know, you can say, I want this machine. This particular machine, I want to use it for the next month. Um, and uh, you'll have that locked down, and they'll charge you some, some rate for it. Uh, if you uh, don't need a particular machine, you don't need a particular time, they have this market where um, you can say, I'll bid that much for that machine. And if no one else bids higher, you get it. The downside is they might give you with just a minute's notice, say, that someone else has bid more. I'm going to take that machine away from you. So we use that to run our computer vision uh, algorithms because it takes roughly one core per cage. And um, it would be cost prohibitive otherwise. And so there's a whole bunch of infrastructure around spinning up those instances, uh, finding where they should be getting their data from, making sure the jobs get done, and finishing them up. Out of that comes uh, various data stores, time series. We have a lot of time series data. And um, this is a place where I'd really love maybe afterwards to talk with various people in the group uh, what the state of the art is around processing time series data, because it's a, a field that um, I think uh, is really important to us. And um, maybe there, has, there, there are some big opportunities there to improve it. Um, and then uh, we make it available over the research suite. And then we have various ways to download the data. And the size of this whole thing, uh, we were at 2.4 petabytes not too long ago. Uh, it's growing really fast. Um, one of my, my um, most uh, nail-biting moments as a CEO is when I see the Amazon Web Services bill every month. <laughs> because it just keeps going up. And a typical study, uh, here's one, 18 cages, 11 days. It's about uh, a terabyte and a half. So let me tell you a little bit about how we do the activity measure. And this has evolved over time. Actually, our very first way of measuring activity uh, was we took the cameras, and the cameras had a setting for constant video quality. And we set that, and then we looked at the bit rate coming out. And that actually gave a pretty good indication of motion, just basically how many pixels are changing on the screen. What we do today is we use optical flow. Um, uh, and so you can see a typical image on the left. Uh, we run an optical flow algorithm, uh, not a dense optical flow, just on a, a grid like this. Uh, and then we store the results from that and uh, do various processing on, on the results afterwards. And so out of that, you can see We've got a motion, centimeters per second, active periods, inactive periods. Uh, when you do this kind of thing, of course, you have to do validation around it. Uh, here's some validation data where we uh, took a little um, whirly gig, a little motor that goes around in circles so we knew the exact speed of it, compared that to our, our 
the speeds given out by our optical flow data and uh, nice, nice correlations there, good high R squared values. So that's one thing you can do with the video um, and with this optical flow map. Uh, another thing we do with that optical flow map is we line them up into kind of this time-space structure. And then we look for regions of that that have periodic motion. It's essentially a time-space Fourier transform. And uh, we do some filtering around that. We find the right frequency. And with that, we can see the breathing rate of animals. Um, we can see that as the chest heaves in and out, uh, that causes these little fluctuations in pixels. We can detect those. And it's amazing how sensitive this can be. You know, you can look with your eye and not see anything that's happening. But just a few pixels there, uh, this can pick them up. And of course, we had to validate this as well. You can see a typical validation da data set. What you do to validate this is you take the animal and you put them in a tube and you measure the pressure on that tube as they, as they breathe in it. Uh, that, of course, the first thing that happens is you take the animal out of their cage, you put them in that tube, uh, they're scared out of their wits and they're breathing at a really high rate, um, which isn't good for science because now you've perturbed the experiment. You've made that observation process part of the experiment. Here we're getting all that naturally in the home cage, uh, which is uh, much more representative. Um, so um, I alluded to this a bit before in that we're now bringing in uh, TensorFlow and using the ImageNet libraries to move from this optical flow-based method to using neural nets as classifiers. Uh, and some of the things we're classifying are like, uh, are they climbing on the ladder? Are they at the running wheel? Are they eating? Are they drinking? And our general approach to this is we begin with uh, defining the metrics. We label a corpus. And so uh, we'll often hire high school students to come in for an afternoon and just sit in front of a terminal and click on that, 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 that. We've built some tools for them. We take that corpus, and then uh, we train models around that. And we iterate and iterate and iterate. And um, we're to the point now where we're getting some pretty good results out of that. Uh, and we've got that running on our, our big uh, central in infrastructure at AWS. Those things just haven't been released yet, so um, you'll have to come to Vime if you want to see them in detail. But uh, there's a lot of really interesting work going on there. So um, maybe just to sort of bring this all together, let me show you just a few scientific results that come out of this. Uh, so you can ex understand exactly how this, this translates all the way through. Uh, so here's an example. This is uh, a model of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this is a, a disease where uh, uh, you get inflammation, degradation of the joints, results in pain, loss of motion. Um, it's a terrible disease. Uh, many people get it as the, at various stages in their life. There's a model where you take a rat and you inject a protein, collagen, and it causes an inflammatory response that mimics arthritis. And what you do conventionally is you would take a pair of calipers like this, and you'd measure how thick that rat's paw is. Uh, and you'd do that maybe three times a week. Uh, every time you do that, uh, you stress out the animal. Of course, depending on how tight you squeeze with the calipers and whether you measure here or here or like this or like that, you get variable answers. Well. Um, what we did is we said, wouldn't it be better to look at how the animals are moving? Because after all, that's what you care about. You know, If I have arthritis and my joints are swelling, but I can move around, that's better than vice versa. Uh, and so we were able to develop metrics that track uh, pretty much exactly with this caliper measurement. And we had to do a number of different statistics. We did try uh, training a network on this, and we did get a network that, that matched really well. Um, it's not what we use because uh, we couldn't explain why it worked. And because we're talking to scientists and people are making decisions that affect human safety, you want to make sure you can explain what's going on. So we found a statistic where when we looked at the maximum velocity and we took the top 25 maximum velocity events during the day and we charted that, it looks, uh, that's what you see in the red, the orange, and it looks exactly like the blue, lays over very well. And if anything, it's maybe a little more sensitive. It's detecting the onset of arthritis a day or so earlier. Uh, and then you go and you, um, you do all kinds of standard of care drugs. So these are several different drugs, dexamethasone, Embril, ibuprofen, methotrexate that are used to tr treat arthritis. And you can see that we're getting uh, good correlations between them. And that gives us a validation that uh, what we're measuring is actually important. Um, on the right, 
this is comparing to the gold standard, which is uh, when the experiment's over, you dissect the animals, you look at the joints under a microscope, you have a trained pathologist look at that and looks for wearing and inflammation and things like that. And um, you can see we actually, our motion metric has better concordance with the conventional histopath. Uh, so if you compare the uh, orange to the light gray, uh, they often line up better than the dark gray to the light gray, which is the conventional way of doing it. So we're actually giving a deeper view into things um, and a more accurate view. And so this is all done automatically. And what that means is that now I don't need to have those people making those measurements every day, those measurements which weren't very good anyways. Uh, that means that I can run the experiments in a more hands-off way. And it means I can run larger experiments because uh, previously, to get consistent results, you'd have to have one person make all the same measurements. And now, because we've automated that, it means that you've removed that roadblock. So uh, that means you can test more drugs, make decisions faster, and move them through that pipeline faster. So uh, maybe just to close, um, and I've got a lot of these examples that we could go into. Uh, let me talk a little bit uh, about another application here, uh, which is uh, humane endpoint prediction. And this is kind of a neat predictive analytics thing. So one of the biggest problems that happens in an animal study is uh, you'll come in the morning and you'll find an animal dead in the bottom of the cage. And that's bad for a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, you usually when an animal dies, you want to do uh, a necropsy on it. You want to take blood, you want to look at the tissue, because that tells you a lot about the biology that's going on. And um, if you find the animal dead, you can't do that, because uh, there's a cellular breakdown process that occurs. And unless you get it within about 30 minutes, just that data is not very good. Also, if you're giving a drug to this animal, now you have a problem, because you don't know if your drug actually caused that. And um, that might, that's a big safety issue. You know. How are you going to feel confident taking this drug into a person if you found an animal dead? And so what we did is um, looked at these various signals we collect. And um, we were able to develop ways that we could predict when an animal was going to be found dead, the night before or even two nights before. And uh, here's a little experiment on the right uh, where in this group, this is actually a brain cancer study, glioblastoma, terrible disease. Uh, 15 animals were found dead. And using our predictive analytics, 10 of those we were able to find, uh, we were able to predict. We had a very clear signature. Uh, and so we could have predicted that and um, uh, not uh, uh, sacrificed those animals properly and get, gotten all that additional data uh, that's useful for understanding the disease. Uh, in the middle here, uh, these are animals that reach humane endpoint. So typically what you'll do is you'll have a veterinarian looking and say, this animal looks healthy. This animal's sick. We really need to euthanize it. Well, we detected those the same way. And uh, for the, the healthy animals, uh, we were 100% on those. So in this way, we're developing a tool that allows you to better care for the animals. And um, this is important for a number of reasons. Um, uh, and I'll just close here by talking about animal welfare a little bit, because you know, uh, I could see people squirming a little bit when I'm talking about animals dying and necropsy. I mean, I, for me to get into this, it, it, it was a big step. Um, and it's because I believe that this work is important. It's, in fact, behind pretty much every medical advance that we all benefit from. But that means that it's incumbent on us as society and as researchers to do the best that we can. Uh, and there are a set of principles around that called the three R's, which are uh, replacement, reduction, and refinement, which means that wherever you can, you should replace lower species with higher, spe higher species with lower species. So, uh, you know, if you can learn it from a, a rat, you shouldn't do it in a dog. Um, and if you can learn it from a computer, you shouldn't do it in an animal at all. Uh, it means you should refine how you do experiments uh, to care for the animals better, to get as much information out of it. And you should reduce the number of animals that you use. And um, we're able to do all those things. So because we have a much more sensitive measure here, we can often do, often do experiments with smaller group sizes. Uh, you know, um, to give you an example, a, a case where conventionally you'd need to do seven animals to get statistically significant results, we can do it with two. And so that's a huge benefit uh, in reduction in animals. 
by watching the animals much more closely, uh, we can tell when they need veterinary care, when they're in distress. And rather than uh, waiting till the next day, the system sends an alert. The veterinarian pulls it up on her cell phone. She looks at it. She says, this is what needs to be done. And we have a very tight loop around that. And then we're getting more information out of rodents, which makes it less necessary sometimes to do uh, studies in higher species. So to close out the net of all this is, um, I showed you this at the beginning, uh, this 15-year and $2.5 billion per approved drug. Well, um, because we're able to run studies more effectively at scale, it means that much of the cellular work, uh, we can do that earlier. Um, we can test more compounds, uh, which gives you better, better information earlier. We're uh, able to do the animal studies more efficiently. We're able to make better judgments on whether a, a particular drug is working or not. And so we shorten up that whole part of the pipeline. And then we get better compounds uh, into the human clinical trials. And so the result of all this is we're trying to pull in that 15-year timeline so that we can get better therapies to market faster. So uh, I'll just leave it there. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you.